Welcome back to Kings of the North. Really excited for this one. Doug Maurice, Bill Landis. We are going to have a quarterback draft of Northern quarterbacks. But Bill, can you explain the parameters sort of of what, what we're, how we're considering the quarterbacks as we draft them? Yeah. So it's not, it's not like, um, a fantasy draft where we're just kind of like drafting who we think is the best quarterback to put on our fictional roster. It's like drafting the quarterback and his situation. So it's like where, where he's at, what we think he might accomplish over the course of his career, how many years of eligibility he has left, that kind of stuff. And I even considered like, do you think this player's coaching staff might be inclined mm-hmm. to recruit a transfer over him before his time comes like that, that, that kind of thing. So it's like a, it's like a more holistic look, I think, at all at all the quarterbacks in the North and drafting them. I, I, I don't know what you would – I guess it's up to us, right, what we what we tend to prioritize. But, like, you know, I, I consider, like, how much do I think this guy's going to win? Do I think this guy could be an All-American? Do I think he could be a Heisman Trophy candidate? Do I think he could win a national championship? That kind of stuff. But not necessarily guys who might do those things or be in contention to do those things this year, if that makes sense. Yeah, we're going to draft a lot of guys who aren't projected starters in 2025. And the reason we're doing this is because I at least am enthused about the future of quarterback play in the North. And this came out of watching all these spring games. And there were a lot of backup quarterbacks that popped to me a little bit. And then you look at some recent recruiting rankings of the North getting some quarterbacks. I think a Northern quarterback renaissance is on the horizon. And I also think we're in a weird bridge year in 2024 because more than half of our 26 Northern teams are going to start a quarterback who is in his last year of college eligibility. So next year is going to be a sea change. And there are a lot of young guys waiting. And I don't, we've talked a lot about getting off the transfer quarterback carousel. And I think when you look at programs like Notre Dame, you look at programs like Oregon, I think there are some programs that have been on that carousel that are going to get off it because there are some young guys waiting. So we wanted to find a way to talk about 2025 quarterbacks in an interesting way. And then you came up with this draft idea. Renaissance. Come I like in. Renaissance. It was kind of illuminating. And we're, we're, we're going to talk about this, but like just going through and assessing the quarterback situations at all of our teams, but then like really catching a glimpse of just the top quarterbacks in the most recent recruiting class. It's a lot of North, man. Yes. There's, a whole lot, there's a whole lot of North there. It was, I, and, and like I knew that, but then like kind of just like seeing it all stacked up there, I was like, oh man, this is going to get pretty, pretty crazy in a hurry. And that has not always been the case. Yeah. There was this long time, we talked about it a ton back in the day, between Kerry Collins of Penn State in 1994, I believe it was, and Dwayne Haskins of Ohio State in the 2019 draft, the Big Ten did not have a first-round quarterback in that gap. And so that has already started to change a little bit. And so now when we look from a northern holistic perspective, we're coming off a world where J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix, and Bo Nix all just went in the first 12 picks of the NFL draft. That has not been the norm. Now, of course, you know, like Marcus Mariota was a good quarterback, and there have been some guys here and there. But I think part of the North being behind the South in this modern era of college football has been quarterback play. And there's been this, I think, this gnashing of teeth and butting of heads sometimes in Northern football analysis and Southern football analysis when the defenses have great stats, is it that the defenses are truly great or that the quarterbacks and the offenses are bad? And I think the answer is usually some of both. But man, mm-hmm. I think I think I think the North is rising up with what's on the what's what what is coming at the quarterback position. Like this is real. We're not just doing this because we created a show. Like this is. I think there's real stuff here. No, I know it's a, it's again a, a thing that just sort of like dovetailed nicely with us starting uh, the show. Like we're not we're not we're not. I don't think we're fabricating in anything here, right? And I think there's we're not going to talk about this in this show. And I actually haven't looked at the geographic breakdown of like where all these quarterbacks are coming from. But I I think like generally too, the North is probably producing more high school quarterbacks, and a lot mm-hmm. of that is like the advent of seven on seven, 
um, which has like long been a thing out west and down south, and like nor- northern states are finally like, oh, we should let our football players play football year round if they want to too. So I think that's going to lead to even more um, quarterback production out of the places in the country that we care about. So just for 2025, we're going to be in a place where there's going to be a handful of young quarterbacks who are going to start this year who will be back next year. There's a bunch of schools that are going to lose their guy and pretty clearly have the next quarterback lined up. And then we only have five of our 26 schools that at the moment it feels like they have gigantic question marks at 2025 Mm -hmm. quarterback and will probably be in the market for transfer unless somebody kind of out of nowhere on their roster really jumps up or a guy gets hurt or somebody unexpectedly stays, that kind of thing. So that's like 21 and 26 for 2025 are in good shape. So we're going to draft it at the end. And like I think, for instance, I would guess that maybe the first couple picks – might be guys who aren't starting this year because we're thinking, well, I would rather take three years of this guy who maybe is going to start in 25, 26, and 27, as opposed to one year of Dylan Gabriel or Shadur Sanders or Will Howard or guys like that, because there are so many guys and then we're not going back. It's only like from now on. So awards winning accumulation of stats. That's what you're looking for. So that's at the end. We're going to take a while and lay this foundation because I want Northern fans to understand this. And I want Northern fans to, there's going to be some, like when we we did a quarterback ranking, one through 26 of quarterback rooms in the North uh, several months ago. And it wasn't great. It wasn't in a great spot, but it's a blip year. It's a bridge year. It's a blip year. So we want to talk about that before we look forward. Let's talk about, the 14 guys that we believe will be starters this season and are in their final year of college eligibility. Okay, it's a long list, 14 people. Mike, bring those up. We got Will Howard, Ohio State transfer, one-year transfer. Dylan Gabriel, Oregon transfer, one-year transfer. Shadur Sanders at Colorado. This will be his second year as a starter at Colorado. He also started two years at Jackson State, so this is it for him. Riley Leonard, Notre Dame, one-year transfer, right? We're talking about three one-year bridge guys for three gigantic Northern teams that are all trying to make the playoff this year, Landis, right at the top of that list. And we understand why Ohio State, Oregon, and Notre Dame did this now, but we don't think this should be their plan all the time, right? No, and I don't I don't think it will be. Uh, now, Notre, Notre Dame is on a couple of years now of doing this, and so is Oregon, but I think... Oregon's got Dante Moore in the pipeline, I think, to, to help get them off of this. Uh, certainly, Ohio State doesn't want to be in the business of, of having a transfer quarterback every year. And, and Well, I guess technically they could, with Julian saying, but it, I think that's like a different that's a different beast, bringing him in as a true freshman transfer um, from Alabama. But I, I, don't, I don't know that any of these programs want to be this, right? And it's not to say, yeah. like, it's not, it's not bad. Like, it's not, it's, it's the way of the world, right? And they're, they're doing it better than a lot of other programs so they probably deserve credit more than they deserve um you know any any kind of critique or, or criticism for for having transfer quarterbacks but um i i don't i if we did this over like te- over 10 years i think most years um these teams would not have a transfer quarterback and i just i differentiate between getting a fully formed starter who's going you're going to plop into your offense and we know he's the starter versus we did get a transfer, but we got him when he was young. Like Dante Moore at Oregon is a different kind of transfer than Dylan Gabriel at Oregon. Mm-hmm. Julian Sayan, obviously, who was at Alabama for a month, is a different kind of transfer than Will Howard. So, you know, th- this is these are them grabbing in this offseason, these three major northern schools who are trying to make the playoff grab one-year starters in the portal and are plopping them in just for 2024. All right, that's four. Cam Rising in year seven at Utah. This is his last year. I I don't think he's going to get an eighth year. Probably not an eighth year. I don't know. Uh, he's, COVID, who knows? I don't know. COVID, right, so COVID rules combined with injuries. Like, I don't know. He could yeah. petition for one and maybe get one and be yeah. 31 years old next year. <laughs> uh, Garrett Green at West Virginia, who we're very excited about, right? He's had like a normal path, but that means I think he you know, kind of was two years of getting ready and now two years as a full-time starter. This will mm-hmm. be his last year. Cade McNamara at Iowa 
who was coming off the ACL surgery, formerly was a starter at Michigan, of course, in 2021, Michigan made the playoff, was a starter at Iowa last year, got hurt back as the starter this year. This is his last year. So that is, uh, that's the, the first group. Then we have Kyle McCord at Syracuse, who spent two years as a backup at Ohio State, one year as the starter at Ohio State. He's going to Syracuse for one year. I kind of wish he had two years at Syracuse. Wouldn't that be great? He got boned in <laughs> his yeah. first year. By I, I can't remember. It might have been like Michigan State in the fifth game. He played like four snaps, and now he lost an entire year of eligibility because of that. Depending how things go, I wonder if there would be a a waiver request there. So, so I, yeah, I I, I don't know how that works. Um, nobody knows how the NCAA works. It maybe depends who picks up the phone. They're like, ah, four snaps, you're good. <laughs> Click eligibility re- maintained. Yeah. But at the moment, it, it seems like this will be Kyle McCord's last year at Syracuse. Will Rogers at Washington, former Mississippi State starter, being dropped in for a one-year start. Hudson Card at Purdue, former Texas starter, is in year two at Purdue, but this will be his last season with the Boilermakers. Tyler Van Dyke, one-year starter, dropping in at Wisconsin after being a multi-year starter at Miami. Curtis Rourke, one-year starter at Indiana after being a multi-year starter at Ohio. Max Brosmer. One-year starter at Minnesota in year six of college football after being a multi-multi-year starter at New Hampshire. And this, as we record this on Thursday, this just happened Thursday morning. It brought us from 13 final season quarterbacks in the North to 14 final season quarterbacks in the North. Mike Wright will be Northwestern's starting quarterback this year. He just Mm -hmm. committed on Thursday morning, former Vanderbilt starter. Northwestern had no quarterback. Brendan Sullivan who maybe was in line for that after starting several games in his career, left in the portal after spring football. As we talked to Matt Shelton of Northwestern on the show, um, on the last show on on Tuesday, it was like the staff kind of told him what was up. You knew Northwestern was going to get a guy. This is the guy. So you can act like there's going to be a competition at Northwestern. There's not. This is his final year of eligibility. That's 14 of 26 landers. And a lot of these guys, I mean, like, I didn't count how many are transfers. Man, there's a lot of transfers. There's a lot of bridge the gap momentary solutions, which are fine. And we have to get used to, but I still think is a more dangerous way to live. Yeah. I mean, everyone on this list is a transfer. These seven are all transfers. I, yeah. I don't know. I think Will Howard is transferring. <laughs> These, everyone, but. Cam Rising and Garrett Green are transfers. Cam, Cam Rising started at Texas, so he has transferred. Oh, oh, it's right. He is a transfer. That's right. That's right. So it's um, literally the only one who's not is Garrett Green. This is Garrett Green. Of West Virginia. Everybody else started their careers at another school. What yeah. has our sport turned into? <laughs> it's pretty crazy, actually. But again, like I, I don't like I think maybe not the second part of this list, I think there are some teams here who probably are going to be on the court on the transfer train for another year or two. Um but I, but I th- I think there's reason to be hopeful that they will eventually get off of it. Um, no, maybe I don't know, just a couple of them. So so yeah, no, it's crazy that they're all that thirteen of the fourteen are transfers. But that's just the reflection of the world we live in. I'm sure if we did this with the South, we'd find something similar. It's one of those things where having. One year established people drop in as your starting quarterback is better than having no quarterback. So that Mm -hmm. for for some programs, it's difficult for them to recruit and develop quarterbacks. So this is a godsend. But if you're a higher tier program, we still think you'd be better off recruiting and developing your quarterback. So some of these schools will stay on. The transfer quarterback carousel and some will hop off. Yeah. And also too, like I, I agree with you about the about higher tiered programs, but even if like if the, the fear if you're a, a tier below that or multiple tiers below that is that if you are inclined to recruit and develop, like you just you're fearful of losing that guy eventually, right? So like why even invest the time to do it in the first place? Like I, which I, I I get it, but I probably would still do it. College football is ruthless business at the moment, man, right? <laughs> to be at that level where, and that's still, that's always been the most difficult level though. You and I have spent most of our college football careers covering Ohio State. And it's like, oh, Ohio State recruiting. Oh, it's hard to recruit at that level. But if you're Ohio State or Alabama or Georgia, every player in the country is open to you. You can at mm-hmm. least try. 
it's still fascinating to me to be at a level where we're recruiting this kid. I hope he's not too good. I hope he doesn't have too good of a senior season. I hope he doesn't. And it's like, hey, yeah. your committed quarterback recruit threw six touchdowns in the opener of his high school football season. And you're like, oh, no. Oh, no. Here comes Oregon. Yeah. Where you thought you had a little diamond in the rough. And now that's always existed in recruiting. But now it exists with your own oh, current no. roster. Yeah. Which is, we talked, and you and I didn't talk about this, but for instance, when we had Ryan Burns on talking about Minnesota earlier in the week, he was saying one of the reasons that P.J. Fleck may never hold a spring game again at Minnesota is because he doesn't want to publicize his young players so that other teams come in and steal them in the portal. <laughs> and I thought, that's crazy. Unless it's it? completely reasonable. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Actually, it, it is it is uh, bordering on uh, insane, I think. <laughs> but also, like, I get it. I I understand. Because on on one hand, I'm like, is that like that's the difference? But on the other hand, it's not like personnel departments in college football are so advanced across the board right now that every program is totally aware of every. 42nd and 53rd and 68th guy on everybody else's roster. So I guess it could actually be a thing where somebody in the personnel department walks into the head coach's office and says, Hey man, I was checking out the Minnesota spring game. They have a guy who's fifth on their receiver depth chart, who's six, three and can go up and make contested catches and looks pretty fast. We should look at that guy. I'm not even sure what his name is. I'll double check. And PJ Flex like, no. So, <laughs> so they're just hiding. So now you have to hide. You have to sandbag your own program to prevent your players, all of whom are free agents at every moment of their existence from yeah. leaving. Hey, guys, let's go out and have a great year. Let's try to win at least seven games, but let's not win 10. Because if we win 10, <laughs> we're not going to have a team next year. Too what many people be paying attention. Yeah. But I think that's also true of uh, – that's not merely like a – a third tier or and or below worry. Like I think even a place like Ohio State or Oregon, right? If you have like a freshman who balls out in your spring game, but like you just know he's not going to do much for you in the fall, it's like you're probably terrified. <laughs> What's going to happen? Like Georgia's yeah. like, oh, we need a safety. That's that, that freshman in Oregon looks pretty good. I guess we'll go get him. Yeah. Do you think Ryan Day is like whispering in Air Nolan's ear before the spring game? It's bounce a few out there, Air. Yeah. Like yeah. try to look a little jittery in the pocket. Aaron Nolan's like, I got this. I I have a complete full understanding of the offense. Ryan Day's like, well, don't show it. Don't yeah. tell anybody. Just hands him a brand new playbook on the morning of the spring game. We're running this today. Have fun. Uh, yeah. Ryan Day is like telling Jim Knowles, like, run this coverage, run this coverage. Yeah. It'll stop. It'll <laughs> like Aaron Nolan's like, what was that? I I thought there were no blitzes. <laughs> they blitzed from three different gaps. Oh, sorry, Air. And we're just using that as, as an example of like, that would be a person in a world where Julian Sand and Air Noland are two young quarterbacks at Ohio State. Like you, you're trying to hold on to everybody. Mm -hmm. They're going to fix it, right? We're going to fix the sport. We don't like to talk about rule. Can we fix? They're going to fix it. It's going to be fixed. This makes no sense. <laughs> Hiding your players in spring games is a possibly reasonable solution in the current situation of college football it is not a reasonable thing in the world to do every year yeah yeah like if they were having the meeting get 35 people in a conference room in indianapolis and solve college football this would be something i was listening to this kings of the north show they said minnesota's hiding players in the spring game <laughs> it's secret you got to be a member of dinky town athletics to get to go figure out who the 43rd best player on Minnesota's roster is because PJ flex worried that Kirby smarts going to see him. What a world. What a world. All right. So let's talk about now. Those were 14 guys who are going to be done after this year. They're the projected starters are going to be done. Let's talk about now some young starting quarterbacks in the North this year that are projected starters but have more than one year of eligibility remaining. And I think is this is the beginning of these guys are going to get drafted, right? In our draft at the end of this. So these are some intriguing guys of like, okay, you're, you're not just getting one year of this guy. You're maybe getting two, maybe three. Rocco Beck at Iowa State is really interesting. 
He had mm-hmm. a, a very good year last year. And we've been enthused about Garrett Green and Rocco Becht and talking about West Virginia and Iowa State, but Rocco Becht has multiple years of eligibility. He was a first year starter last year. So he's got a couple left. Like this is this is a good young quarterback who's still ascending. Yeah. He was a redshirt freshman last year. So he's got he's got three years left. Um very interesting. Which is very interesting. I don't like this. I don't like talking about these guys before we draft. Listen, man, you're not going to sneak anything past me. <laughs> okay, so and I'm now. I know this one, Aiden Childs, yeah. who on our Leap Day four year look ahead show, Bill Landis predicted as a future Heisman Trophy finalist, will be the uh, first year starter at Michigan State. Could be a three year starter at Michigan State overall. You're looking at chops for this guy. Yep. I think he's going to be really good. I, I, I think. Now, don't PJ Fleck me. You're like, I'm not talking about these guys before yeah. the draft. Uh-huh. You can't hide, Landon. I'm going to start. I'm going to start negging them like uh, NFL draft guys do. <laughs> You're he's got a weird information. He's, he's got weird mechanics. I don't know. Yeah. Nobody um, went to his birthday he's gonna, party. He's going to weird mechanic his way all the way to <laughs> NYC. <laughs> Dylan Rayola, true freshman, will be the starter at Nebraska. Could be a four-year starter at Nebraska. This is no secret. Mm-hmm. We'll f- see where he goes in the draft. Drew Aller is going to be a third-year quarterback and second-year starter at Penn State. If it hits, he could go. At the moment, my guess would be Penn State still has two years of Drew Aller left. That I don't yeah. think he is going to have the kind of season that will be a, well, I'm a first-round quarterback, I'm out of here season. He might have a very good season, but he actually might come back and in 2025 be a Heisman Trophy contender for a a playoff contender in year two of an Andy, Andy Kotel nicky offense. I still mm-hmm. think Drew Aller's still potentially ascending, not a finished product. Yeah, I think I'm, I'd agree with that, and I, I am of the mind that he has two more years there because okay. even if he's very good this year, like to, to get to the point where he would want to leave after three years, like you would have to make, I don't know, maybe one of the biggest jumps we've seen a quarterback make in one season. Right. I just, I just don't yeah. know if that that's possible. Yeah. Ethan Kaliak Manis won the job as a Minnesota transfer at Rutgers. And again, this feels like a multi-year thing at Rutgers, the way Greg Shiano wants this to work. Right. Yes, I don't. I actually haven't looked up his eligibility situation, but he's he's got at least multiple two two years left. At least one more year you have to look beyond this I one. Right? I made so, a but, chart. Let's see. My let's look at my chart. My chart says, uh, "What do I have?" I don't know. I can't even. I can't even read my own chart. He well, he's got either. years left. He's got multiple years left. Yeah, I just didn't know if he had two or three. Um, after this, two one. left. You were, two left. Two, two left. left. He was a 2021 recruit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two left. But yeah, definitely um, a multi year situation at Rutgers. Yeah. And then MJ Morris is in a three way quarterback battle at Maryland, the NC State transfer, who's uh, started, I think, seven games at NC State. I am still operating under the assumption, and we kind of talked about this after the Maryland spring game, that they were talking a lot about he's just still learning the offense, that kind of thing. But then when, when he has the offense, fully in hand, I think he will beat out the two guys who were there already, including Billy Edwards. So are you okay with calling MJ Morris a, a projected starter here? Yeah, I'm good with that. I, I think it'll end up that way. I mean, he would have, I guess, liked for it to be a little more clear um, coming out of spring ball, but I think I think that is reasonable to project him as a starter, and I think he has three more years left, too, which is pretty enticing. So a guy I did not put on this list, and we can talk about him briefly here, is our guy Thomas Castellanos, who was the starter Mm. at Boston College a year ago, has multiple years of eligibility remaining. He was he was one year somewhere else before he came to one year one year at Central Florida before he came to Boston College. So he has multiple years remaining. Uh, I just didn't put him on this list because with new head coach Bill O'Brien. I just don't know what's going to happen there. And they brought in Grayson James as a transfer quarterback from Florida International, who only has one year remaining of eligibility. And I don't, I'm not assuming that Thomas Castellanos, I, I actually am like, feel more certain about MJ Morris at Maryland than I do about Thomas Castellanos at Boston College, even though Thomas Castellanos took over as a starting quarterback at BC, like in the middle of the first game last year and never let it go. And MJ Morris was at NC State last year. I'm, I'm maybe, I'm, Preparing for the worst, hoping for the best with our guy Thomas Castellanos. But you, do you think I should have put him on this list? 
I no, I think it's reasonable not to. Um, like Bill Bill O'Brien has had the opportunity, right, to say like Thomas Castellanos is definitely a starting quarterback, and I don't know that he has given that endorsement. Now, maybe he doesn't feel like he has to because he was a starting quarterback last year, but it felt like coming out of spring that that was a little up in the air. So I'm I'm okay with not having him on this list due to that uncertainty. Okay, so those are guys who we are intrigued about this coming season. They're going to start, but whatever they show you in 2024, they're going to have more opportunity to show in 2025. And again, I, I mean, I guess guys like that could always leave. And there are a couple of those schools that maybe have some guys behind them as well. But I, I think there's a good chance that those six will be back starting at those same schools in 2025. So yeah. that was part one of laying the foundation. When we come back, we're going to lay the foundation in part two in talking about more specifically some of these young quarterbacks to keep an eye on before we get to the draft. We'll do that next on Kings of the North. Doug and Bill, Kings of the North. You can drop a review on Apple Podcasts if you'd like. There's one in there that's a one-star review that we are going to talk about next week in a, in a very specific way. So I never ask you for a specific number of stars, but we're eager for the feedback, eager for the interaction. So if you want to drop a thumb, Whichever way the thumb goes on YouTube, we certainly appreciate that. If you want to drop a podcast review, we certainly appreciate that. We want to run through some of these young guys and, and why we're doing this. But I think that the stat that, that opens your eyes a little bit is the 24-7 sports composite recruiting rankings mm -hmm. for quarterbacks in the class of 2024, for the guys who will be true freshmen this season six of the top nine quarterbacks wound up at northern schools seven of the top 14 wound up at northern schools and that you took with a bit of surprise and then some bubbling glee yeah mostly bubbling glee like i, I just think it's really exciting and like Ohio State has carried the uh, quarterback mantle for the North for quite some time, um, and it's nice to see a number of programs, I think, taking a step forward in the way they evaluate and, and recruit the position. Um, yeah. Even, like, seeing, like, a team like Indiana up there, right? Like, that's cool. So, um, and I hope that seeing a team like Indiana up there really might open the eyes of some other teams in the North who might think, and now, like, Indiana's kid, like, is from their backyard. I understand that. Like, sometimes you just get lucky. Um, but I think it shows you that, like, there are some other teams in the North maybe who aren't on this list currently that we're looking at. Um, they might be able to take some similar swings and go get themselves a, a big-time quarterback, so it's very exciting. We aren't going to mention that the number one quarterback in the class of 2025, Bryce Underwood, is from Michigan and committed to LSU. We're going to skip that part. Is that right? Yep, we're going to skip that part, Yep, and we're going we're gonna to silently blame Michigan. Yeah. yeah, but they maybe can get it going again because Brian Kelly seems like he's on tilt sometimes at LSU. Right, Brian. Brian Kelly got shook by Indiana beating them for CJ West. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. So that's one of those. I mean, like as as we did a transfer portal show, there's still our transfer guys kind of leaking in here, making final decisions. And CJ West, the, the uh, former MAC defensive lineman that we talked about, as you know, people are interested in this dude. Indiana got him. That's a, that's a huge win for your guy Kurt Signetti that's to right. land a defensive lineman who's going to be an, an immediate impact guy. And in the new world, sometimes Indiana beats LSU for a guy, huh? In this world, welcome to welcome to the new world, LSU. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't have left Brian Kelly. Could have been a king. Could have been. just a crawdad. That's right. <laughs> Top quarterbacks in the class of twenty twenty four. Number one on this list by the. 24-7 composite rankings, Julian Sayan, who initially committed to Alabama, left after Nick Saban retired, landed at Ohio State. Could we look back on this, Landis, as one of uh, the seismic moments in recent college football history? Because Julian Sayan probably is going to go pretty high in our draft. I am keeping some percent chance held out that he winds up in some version of a Tua Tonga Vailoa slash Trevor Lawrence true freshman season situation where he plays meaningful snaps for Ohio State this year, whether it's the middle of the year, the end of the regular season, or after halftime of the national championship game. 
this is a big one for him to be a Buckeye, though, right? Yeah, it's huge. Um, and I don't know. I'm trying to think the last couple of quarterback classes, but like Sam was like a late riser in in this recruiting class. But like by the end of it, I think everyone was like, "Yeah, that's the top guy." Um, and it'll be it'll be interesting. I think probably, I guess three years from now or three and a half ish years from now. Um, when we're watching the NFL draft and they're doing a nice video package on Julian saying, and they're going to talk about the, what if, what if Nick Saban had not retired and what would have transpired had Julian saying not become available for Ohio state. It's it's seismic's the right word for it. It's pretty crazy that Ohio state ended up with him. Cause he's the kid. I think Ohio state on their board, like evaluated him as the top guy. They just, by the time they had lost Dylan Rayola, that's another like layer to it too. Like they had Dylan Rayola, Dylan Rayola left the class and by that time it was probably like too late to get in on julian saying and then by a stroke of luck nick saban deciding he wanted to retire ohio state got an opportunity to take another swing out where's julian saying from carlsbad california california so these these guys are linked the next guy on the list is dylan rayola who was the number three quarterback in this class had initially committed to ohio state was the number one quarterback at that time decommits, commits to Georgia, moves to Georgia for a senior year of high school, plays there, then decommits from there and winds up at Nebraska where his uncle is the offensive line coach and his dad was an All-American offensive lineman. However it happened, this is seismic also. Mm -hmm. what, what this could mean for this era of Nebraska football, there's no guarantees, but we liked how he looked in the spring game. He's definitely going to start as a true freshman. You're looking at three, maybe four years of starting play from Dylan Rayola for this new Matt Rule era. Again, potentially seismic. I also like to like the the timing of Rayola getting there as a true freshman in only year two of Matt Rule. Like it almost allows you to like build everything around him, right? Like he's yep. been I guess that could lead to like some growing pains early on, certainly, but it's not like there have been there's been like things in place, tenants in place that Nebraska wants to be as a program that maybe you suddenly would have to change to like better suit Dylan Riola. It's like, no, you kind of been doing it for a year. You were kind of flying by the seat of your pants last year in year one anyway. So now it's like you can take a take a step back, get this really talented quarterback and and use him as the thing that you're kind of building your entire program build off of. And I like he certainly could have wound up at Ohio State mm -hmm. when it was like, oh, he's gonna go to Georgia. It's like, okay. But I really like a player like this at a program like this, at a yeah. traditional power that's trying to get it back, rather than him winding up at Ohio State or Michigan or Oregon, where he would just sort of be the next in line and continues, continuing something. He has a chance to restart something and bring a former Northern power back. So like that would be it's very cool. Great for the show. No, I mean great for the. I meant great for the fans. Sorry, yeah. but I, I misspoke both. there. We can both benefit. Yeah. Next up, number four in this recruiting class is Air Noland, who was recruited by Ohio State. Once Dylan Rayola decommitted, Air Noland became the target for Ohio State. Long term, Julian Sayan and Air Noland will not both last at Ohio State. That's just yeah. it's just not realistic to have the fact that there are two guys this highly ranked in the same recruiting class is crazy. It's only because of the next saving thing that we said. He's from Georgia. Maybe he'll be better than Julian saying. But the thing you want to keep in mind here is, man, northern schools, be on alert. Keep your eyes peeled unless Ohio State takes all their games off TV. Maybe if Ohio State's in a blowout situation and they're playing Akron, Ryan Day is going to cut the feed when he puts Julian <laughs> Sand and Aaron. It's called a fleck. When he, yeah. they put Julian Sand and Aaron Nolan in the game, it's like, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, we lost the feed. Sorry, guys. Hey, did you guys see Aaron Nolan three, through uh, three touchdowns in the second half against Akron? It's like, no, I nope. didn't see it. <laughs> He's a Georgia kid. Sand's a California kid. Man, would be great to keep both these guys in the North one way or another long term. Yeah, one, like you said, one of them will become available at some point, um, whether that's next year or or the year after. Um, and it's good; like it should be encouraging, I guess, for the northern programs that they were already willing to leave home, like go pretty far from home, one time, right? So why not take that swing if and when one of these guys becomes available? Yeah. Attention, Fran Brown. Keep your mm. work with Kyle McCord. 
If Fran Brown wants to build a pipeline to the Ohio State backup quarterback situation, there's worse ways to try to win. It's probably not a bad plan. Yeah. <laughs> CJ Carr, number six overall quarterback by the 24 7 composite ratings. Thought he looked great in Notre Dame's spring game. Mm -hmm. The percent chance that CJ Carr is the starter at Notre Dame in 2025 is what? Uh, 98, maybe. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 Kenny Minchie's pretty good. Like we don't have him on this list. He is. Um, but he's like a pretty electric, exciting quarterback too. So like, I, I, like as we have conversations moving forward about CJ Carr in the future of Notre Dame's quarterback position, I, I do want to make sure we keep mentioning Kenny Minchie because I thought he also looked good in Notre Dame spring game. Yeah, definitely also made some plays in the spring game. And again, like great getting off the carousel though. Yeah. Right after uh -huh. Sam Hartman, Riley Leonard, Marcus Freeman's done with that. They have two options in that quarterback room for next mm -hmm. year. Yeah, like it. Yeah. Number seven on the list is Ethan Grunkemeyer at Penn State, who's an Ohio quarterback. He actually played my kids' high school last year, carved him up, and <laughs> is a good pipeline get for Penn State. Again, this is one of those things, how this should work. This is a kid who, who would theoretically be like at Ohio State's level, except Ohio State was after Dylan Rayola and then Aaron Nolan and then Julian Sayan dropped in their lap. So there's an Ohio kid sitting here who's a clear Power 5 quarterback. When that happened before, Mitch Trubisky wound up at North Carolina several cycles ago. But now this is the second Ohio quarterback that Penn State has grabbed. Actually, it's the third. They went from Sean Clifford, Ohio <laughs> quarterback, to Drew Aller, Ohio quarterback, to Ethan Grunkemeyer, Ohio quarterback. Again, if this is Penn State's plan, Take the best quarterback in Ohio because Penn State can get that guy because Ohio State's not taking a kid from Ohio. They're taking a national kid. Great job, James Franklin. Yeah, they do, they do a good job in Ohio. Um, I also think they have a thing, too, like uh, Drew Aller and Ethan Grunkemeyer like, have the same quarterback trainer in Ohio, so there's like a little little bit of a pipeline in, in that way as well. Um, I like Grunk like Grunkemeyer got a lot better over like the, the last year and a half of his uh, – high school career actually he actually went to the same high school for a little bit or he went to the same high school where like ryan day's kid i think was going to go and then oh, ryan day's kid i think went somewhere else because he had an opportunity to play as a true freshman rather than sit behind grunkmeyer uh last year but um penn state also had this is not necessarily part of this conversation because he's a 2023 commit but i just want to mention it in case anyone at iowa is listening jackson smolik from des moines committed mm -hmm. to penn state in 2023 He's a three-star kid, but he had like a pretty good showing. It was like Elite Eleven guy. Like he was, he was a a guy who I think like raised a, a few eyebrows toward the end of his recruitment last year. And if you think Gronkemeyer is going to be Penn State starter after Drew Aller, then Iowa needs to bring Jackson Smolik home. Oh, okay, Tim Lester. Bill, look at you. You're so yeah, helpful. Just, that, we could contract out that service of mm -hmm. sliding northern pieces around. Yeah that you got a little bit of extra of this? Well, why don't we go over here so that Kentucky doesn't come in and grab a guy like they got Gavin Wimson? Uh, that made me so angry. So angry. Rutgers quarterback, uh, not I don't want to say loser, did not win the job in the spring. Ethan Kalak Manis, as we talked about multiple times, beat out Gavin Wimsett. We wanted a two-quarterback system at Rutgers. Instead, he's from Kentucky, so he went back to Kentucky where Brock Vandegrift is definitely going to be the starter, the guy who who – was a backup at yeah. Georgia and transferred there. So he's not even like, – I, I, good luck to Gavin Wimsett, but, man, we wanted him in the north, and he's going somewhere to not start, at least in 2024. Yeah, and I think, like we said, we, it must just be that Rutgers didn't have any plan whatsoever to play both of those guys because otherwise it doesn't really make much sense to me yeah. to leave Rutgers and go somewhere else to be a backup, unless he just missed home, which is like – that's I get it. I miss home sometimes. Um. But you're not going to go transfer and do like a Temple football show, are you? No, none of the people would listen to it. Yeah. I just planted that seed. Your eyebrow went up for one second. You're like, Temple football show? I covered I, I covered Temple football. Market? I covered Temple football for like two games in the 2011 season. Really? Where were you? Were you in high school? Where were you based? 
When you were I, it was after I graduated and I was interning for the Trentonian in Trenton, New Jersey. And like, I just like my career goal was to always cover college football. So one day, like in, one day in the summer, I just went to the sports editor to the Trentonian. It's like, Hey, you don't have to pay me extra for this, but can I cover temple football? And they're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Look at so you. I what a go getter. I like covered the first two games of that season. Um, I think they might have lost to Villanova actually in their season opener. Um, and then I got a job covering high school somewhere else. And that was the birth of Kings of the North. You were like, you know That's what? Right. I really think we're both Ryan Day and Matt Rule on that Temple staff at the time. Who knows? Oh, actually, I think now makes me want to go back and look. Maybe look at you planting oh. seeds, planting seeds. It was right. Steve Adazio, it was definitely Steve Adazio. Nice. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's number seven on the list. Number nine on the list is Jaden Davis at Michigan, which again, it, I'll be curious. The Michigan quarterback situation situation is still not settled. Alex Orgy probably the leader. Jack Tuttle didn't play in the spring. Still probably in that competition in preseason camp. Davis Warren showed some things in the spring mm -hmm. game. It's where are they going to go with that? I'm wondering if, and all the, like, do, like Jack Tuttle doesn't because Jack Tuttle's a, a, a seventh year guy, I think, as well. But Alex Orgy has multiple years left. But I'm wondering if, you know, Jaden Davis is not in that competition just because he's a true freshman. But no matter what happens with Michigan's quarterback play in 2024, I wonder if Jaden Davis will be very legitimately in the fight to be the starter in 2025. I think he probably will be, and it, it does feel like I'll, I'll even monitor this offseason, like how he continues to climb, because it felt like, based off reps in the spring game, maybe like Jaden Davis might have been already ahead of Jaden Denigal. So like that's kind of like one guy he kind of knocked off. So it's and like Jack Tuttle wasn't around, so that wasn't an opportunity for Jaden Davis to do that. But like, can he find his way to get past Davis Warren? Like, can he can he actually position himself to be QB two in twenty twenty four? Is kind of was kind of what I'm wondering. And it'll be it'll be interesting to follow his career just generally because there was a time when I think a lot of people thought Jaden Davis was going to be the best quarterback in this class, and then I think mostly like he didn't hit a growth spurt. <laughs> so he's like mm. he's just a little quarterback, um, but he's definitely got some skill. And I do think right, Jim Harbaugh's gone. But Sharon Moore is there. There are still some some bones. Kirk Campbell, who's the quarterbacks coach and the offensive coordinator now, he was on that staff right for part of that. They did mm -hmm. a good job developing JJ McCarthy. I think the I think way so. the way they yeah. eased him along, and and I certainly had questions about it. I wondered if he should take the starting job in 2021, and it was like, what are they doing? And why doesn't he play more? And he's like a running quarterback when he comes in. And then in 2022, they carried the competition with Cade McNamara over to the start of the season. And they each started one of the first two games. And you kind of thought, what are they doing? And it was all, it all worked. Every single thing they did along the way with developing JJ McCarthy as a quarterback and preparing that team to win, they hit every check mark and it all worked. So they have a plan. And, and if, they can do some version of that with Jaden Davis. They're going to get a good quarterback out of it. Yeah, I, th I think generally, like Michigan hasn't always had like good quarterbacks, but I think I think and like we'll see how it progresses now that Jim Harbaugh's not there. I think they've done a pretty good job of like sort of like maximizing what they do have. Yeah. Um, so now that they are getting a better raw material, I guess for lack of a better word, with a JJ McCarthy and a Jaden Davis, like there's a real opportunity for this to become. I think a consistent thing where Michigan is, is turning out top flight quarterbacks. But they did, they were scrambling for a while there, right? I mean, Shea Patterson, when he transferred there, was maybe gonna be the the savior of the of the Jim Harbaugh era. At yeah, kind of didn't work out that way. And you remember they're bringing in John O'Corn and they they had uh Jake Rudock come from Iowa, and like that was like a big deal. And JJ McCarthy sort of reset mm -hmm. what Michigan quarterback recruiting and development was. And so now at least there's a blueprint. And so Jaden Davis has something to look at. The last guy, I was just going to do like how many in the top 10, because again, that's six of the top nine are mm -hmm. at Northern schools right now. The best quarterbacks from last year's recruiting class. But I wanted to squeeze in your guy, Tyler Cherry. Of course, Taven Jackson is also there. We talked about Curtis Rourke as a one-year starter. You liked what Taven Jackson did in the spring game as well. We're not forgetting about him, but but Indiana getting a young quarterback like Tyler Cherry, you're in, and this could be a thing, right? I like Tyler Cherry a whole lot. Um, it could very much be a thing, and we'll we'll see. I think I think Taven Jackson and 
is also from Center Grove. Yeah, so they have two Center Grove guys, Tyler Cherry and Taven Jackson, who are going to be like vying to be their quarterback of the future after Curtis works one year. And Taven Jackson, I think, has three years of eligibility left, including this this coming fall. So like that that's more of a long term thing than I think people realize potentially. But Tyler Cherry, I think, has a lot to offer. Um, he was another guy who I think kind of rose a little bit late in the cycle and. Maybe there wasn't enough opportunity for people to realize what he was, but he's like a big dude, a big, strong armed kid. Like it just has like a lot to work with. So I don't know. I don't know if he's someone who can start even next year, just based off like kind of like how raw he is, but there's a ton of upside there. Okay. So those are the guys in this recruiting class. We are now going to run through, I think it's 13 or 14 Northern situations looking at 2025 with teams that we feel like they have a guy ready. So we can brush, if we've covered it already, we'll brush on it a little bit. Once we haven't talked about the guy, we'll dig in a little bit more. But this is what I'm excited about, Bill. This is like the, projecting this forward. I just think so many schools are in at least decent shape. And I we understand the reality of the transfer portal mm -hmm. and what teams need to do. But I like having a plan and the transfer portal being sort of your backup plan as opposed to saying, oh, who's your quarterback next year? It's like, I don't know, somebody in the portal. I think it applies to every school. We understand some schools are going to rely on the portal more, but I, that's everybody's ideal is a better plan than a ah, portal guy. We'll see what, yeah, we'll see who ends up in the portal. Yeah. So we'll start with Ohio State, Julian Sand and Aaron Noland. Will Howard's going to be gone. Devin Brown could be back. Like If Devin Brown beats out Will Howard, then Devin Brown could be the starting quarterback in 2025. We're assuming Will Howard wins the job, which means Devin Brown probably doesn't stick around to try to win it in 2025, although I guess that's not impossible. So I don't want to be dismissive of Devin Brown, but yeah. my expectation is that Ohio starting quarterback in 2025 will be a second-year player, either Julian Sander or Air Nolan. Is that fair? That is also my expectation, but I'm, but I am glad you mentioned Devin Brown only because like he will be a redshirt sophomore this fall, so he has three years left. So like, if Will Howard, if and when Will Howard is named the starter, which everyone expects, like it's not unreasonable for De for Devin Brown to wait around and try to be a starter with two more seasons left to play. But also like, are you going to try to win the job for a third time at Ohio State after you've right. lost it twice? Like that's my my assumption would be no, but also every assumption I've made about Devin Brown to this point has been wrong. So we'll see. We It's been hard to get a handle on. And, yeah. and Devin Brown has something there. I think Devin Brown will be a starting quarterback in the power five in his college football career. Do you agree with that? Yeah. As long as he like, as long as he's not stubborn and keeps staying at Ohio state because he feels like he painted himself into a corner. Yeah. So anyway, but even if he does that, even if he stuck around for 25 and they went with Sand or Noland, he still would have a year to be like, okay, I'm going to go be the starter at Texas Tech yeah. at the very least, right? So yeah. no, 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 we want to keep him north. I'm going to go be the starter at Illinois, right? We want to keep him north. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we think. So uh, next up is Michigan. This is Jaden Davis. If you were putting money down on, make a bet right now based on what you know, who's the starting quarterback at Michigan in 2025? Jaden Davis. Okay. I think I agree with that, too. And we sort of spelled that out. Next up, Notre Dame, CJ Carr. It was good of you to mention Kenny Minchie. I don't want to be dismissive of guys who were just like slightly lower in the recruiting rankings. I think CJ Carr is the starting quarterback in 2025. You said 98%, right? Yeah, I agree with you. I think you will be, too. All right. So we're feeling good about that. Oregon, I put a slash for Oregon. Dante Moore, former five-star, was committed to Oregon. In last year's cycle, decommitted, went to UCLA, started a couple years at UCLA, now transferred back to Oregon, and there's a backup quarterback battle behind Dylan Gabriel for this year. But Austin Novosad is also there, was a highly rated guy. They were in the same class, right? Austin Novosad was a freshman mm -hmm. last year. Yep. So they're both second-year players right now. Gabriel will be gone. I don't think they'll need to go to the portal. So then the 2025 quarterback for Oregon – will be one of these two third-year players. But I thought it was worth including Austin. I thought he looked pretty good in their spring game. I thought it was worth including Novosad in this and not assuming it's Dante Moore. But it feels like they'll come out of it with a pretty good quarterback either way in 2025. I agree with you. I mean, I, I, if I have to pick, I'm, I would pick Dante Moore. Um, but I think Austin Novosad is, is, again, like a, a guy who's 
got something to him, right? Whether or not that comes to fruition at Oregon, I, I, I don't know. But I think similar to what you just said about Devin Brown, like I think Austin Novosad will start for a power four team sometime in his career. Yeah. All right. Next up is Purdue. And this is one of the guys that made me want to do this exercise because I thought Marcos Davila looked really good in Purdue's spring game. And Hudson Card is there as a second year starter at Purdue. He's going to be the starter this year. But I got very excited about Purdue's future. And I think the more you looked at this guy, you got kind of excited about it too. Yeah, I was. I, I went back and watched just like mostly high school stuff, right? To get a better feel for what this guy's about. Um, just like a big, he was, and he's bigger than I thought. Like he's 6'3, six, six, 230. Like that's a big old quarterback for a true freshman. Um, it's exciting. It's exciting for. Purdue to go down to Texas to get a kid like this, like uh, I guess like a lower end mm-hmm. four star prospect, but like a, like still a pretty good passer out of the state of Texas, nonetheless, right? So there's a lot to like there, um, and I think he will. Th- this is like one of the guys. He and Tyler Cherry, like if you're trying to think about like who like who could start in 2025, this is the territory where like I'm I'm slightly worried about like will will Purdue or Indiana like might try to go to get like one more bridge quarterback before these guys mm-hmm. are ready to play but i don't know i think i think i'd rather see purdue like kind of hitch the wagon to a second year marcus davila and let him play for a couple years yeah i i still think for for programs like that you've got to be willing to take some lumps with the guy to get a payoff at the end at a place where you you take lumps sometimes anyway Mm -hmm. like taking lumps is nothing new so what are you doing try to build towards something so i hope i hope both those guys are our starters in 2025, but I would bet my bet is he's the starter in 2025. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would pick that right now. Yeah. All right. And we're fired up about that. Next up, Minnesota Drake Lindsay. He's a true freshman. Now he's a borderline top 20 quarterback in his class from Arkansas. I love that Minnesota got this guy and they've been trying to sort of build their room and they really, again, we've talked about this multiple times. It's just so it's not ironic. It's just the way it works. A year ago, Minnesota was the only team in the Big Ten West that was starting a homegrown quarterback in Nathan Kaliak Manis. The other six Big Ten West schools had transfer quarterbacks. They tried it for a year, and then he left and transferred, and now he's going to be the starter at Rutgers. They have to go and get a transfer quarterback in Max Brosmer as a one-year bridge, but this feels like a developmental plan again. I think they're trying to flesh out their room a little bit, but they I think they have a real future here with Drake Lindsey. I do too. I, I want to know. So, what do you think? So, like Marcos Davila signed with a program that already had a transfer quarterback on the roster. That Minnesota like went out and got a transfer rather than just saying like, "Hey, we're going to let Drake Lindsay play as a freshman." Like, where do you land on that? Are you okay with that? Like, not exposing a guy too early and let him kind of you know incubate for a year behind a transfer. I'm good with a year while you're a okay. true freshman. Nebraska, yeah. like if you're Dylan Rayola and you've been a five star and you've been in quarterback development camps your whole life, maybe throw that guy in as a true freshman, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're the 23rd ranked, the 20th ranked quarterback in your class, you're probably served by a year of development. And I don't think he's mad that Max Brosmer was brought in here because he still has a chance to be a three-year starter at Minnesota. Yeah, I I agree with you. I just like my my only counterpoint to that would be like, Minnesota's not playing for much anyway. Like, what's the harm in just rolling with Drake Lindsay? But um, they're both, they're always a bold team. They're always That's a bold true. team. There is That's a standard true. at Minnesota. I, Minnesota yeah. is not a place, and it, it's hard. I, as a as an analyst and not somebody with a knot in my stomach living and dying with these programs every single week because I love them with all of my heart and soul, I'm okay with a 2-10 and ten if it's in service of something. But, like, Pitt, had been has been a really good program. Pitt was in a New Year's Six Bowl a couple years ago at a first round quarterback, and they had a bad year last year. And people were like, well, "That's it, yeah." What are we right. doing here? And it's like yeah. sometimes at Pitt you win three games. I don't know what to tell you. So sometimes it's hard to go two and ten. So if you can develop, plan for the future, but still take a shot at a bowl, and the Minnesota made a bowl last year at five and seven because they had, were good at academics, which is great. That's probably a better solution because Minnesota has a winning standard. I don't know if people like would realize that, but 
Minnesota's we talked about not, it. High floor, high floor program. Minnesota. Minnesota is not a place where like one and eleven is cool with everybody because oh well, yeah, right. you know. I mean, it's this is a bowl standard team. So I like I like their plan, but I'm very excited they have a guy like Drake Lindsley. Lindsay that they're planning for the future for. Next up is Washington. We talked about this with the Washington spring game on the last show. Damon Williams Jr. followed Jed Fish from Arizona, vanquished Demaricus Davis, who was there as the other quarterback in his class. He's clearly the future. Will Rogers is the one-year bridge right now. Damon Williams Jr. missed some throws in the spring game, but he also showed you a little something. I think Washington fans should be excited about what this guy can be. I think so too, unless he's Florida starting quarterback. No, <laughs> I did see another show. I think it was Split Zone Duo. I saw a clip of them talking about predicting Billy Napier is going to be this year's Neil Brown, which means he's going to be a coach that goes from a hot seat oh. to having an excellent year. So well, that'd be great. Least- I don't. I, I don't typically root for Southern teams, but if it means that Washington can hold on the Jet Fish, then I'd be okay with that. This is. I love. This would be a fun show. Other teams that Northern teams should root for without necessarily realizing it. So maybe it's a one subject show and it's just <laughs> this. Why Washington needs to root for Billy Napier or the Florida Gators to win 10 games. Yeah. But yeah, that'd be a tough one. Well, maybe he'll, and it's one of those things. Once you follow a coach once, like, is that it? And and this was really, because Washington had uh, Austin Mack. They had a guy in the pipeline as the next quarterback, and then they followed Kellen DeBoard, Alabama. It's like, okay. Yeah. If you were a high school kid, would you commit to a coach that much, or would you commit to, I like the quad and my major and the jerseys and the locker room? School more than coach. Uh, hmm. I probably commit to uh, roster before either of them. I think I like places more than I like people. So for me to be like, I'm following this person no matter what, boy, oh boy, that would better be my wife. Yeah. Is my wife the new coach? Then I'm following her, I guess. Otherwise, there's a lot of other things here that I like besides just a single person. Although the other thing that you learn in life, one of the great lessons in life is a bad boss can ruin your life. Mm-hmm. It can make you, you get up and go to work every day and you can have a job and enjoy the job. But if like the person in charge of you is a jerk, it can honestly like completely flip. So I guess maybe people do matter. People like do walk matter. around college campuses. People yeah. matter. Is that officially our stance on this show? People matter. College campuses are nice, but people matter. I don't, I cannot sign off on that. Okay. I can't sign off on that. Even if it's true, I'm, I'm reluctant. (laughs) I'm reluctantly accepting that premise. Eli Holstein is just, I can't get on the bandwagon more for Eli Holstein at Pitt. Nate Yarnell is clearly going to be the starter this year at Pitt. He was a starter at the end of last year. They loved him. But Eli Holstein, we talked about it. A couple of times they brought him in as a transfer from Alabama where he was a backup, was a highly rated, I think top 10 national quarterback in his class. They keep saying Nate Yarnell is the guy this year and Nate Yarnell has multiple years of eligibility left, but how can you go get a guy as highly ranked as Eli Holstein off Alabama's roster and then be like, well, I guess he's going to sit for two years. Oh, well, we kind of like this guy. I just think (laughs) Eli Holstein's lined up for 2025. Yeah, it seems it seems like it. Like they made it they made a, a pretty aggressive play there. I think to go get what they thought was a an upgrade over what they've been at the position since Kenny Pickett left, right? So this is a and not that Kenny Pickett was the best recruit in the world, but I think they're trying to get back to the level of quarterback play where you can like look and say like who has the best quarterback in the ACC and you don't have to go through 17 teams before you get to Pitt. So yeah. Um I think that's that's the idea with Eli Holstein. So I I think he's more than likely going to be their starter next year. Yeah. And, so, and if Nate Yarnell is so good that the highly rated former Alabama guy can't get on the field, then that's a great problem to have. Yeah. Like yeah. Nate Yarnell is second team all ACC, and we play this clip back and think, what were we saying? <laughs> great. But otherwise, Eli Holstein's waiting. And we thought he had a he had a drive in the spring game for Pitt that was like, ooh, ooh, ooh I like that. Mm-hmm. Indiana and Tyler Cherry, we want to keep Taven Jackson in the conversation. It's my fault for not including him here as an or. But regardless, Indiana's quarterback future, 
we like what Kirk Signetti's done. Get a Mac guy as a one-year bridge. And then Taven Jackson had been there. Keep developing him. Bring in a recruit. Like, it's a good plan all the way around. Yes? Yeah, I like it. I like the room they have. Um, again, like, uh, like I said, like, I'm a little worried about when it comes to projecting 2025, like, will they try to go get a transfer? Because the thing about Kurt Signetti is he would run you over with his car if you said two and ten in the service of something. Mm-hmm. He only he only he only wins. Ask him about it. He'll tell you all about it. So like he's not going to let his quarterback room be deficient in the uh chase for uh seven win season. Okay. But but we've yeah. I think you might have to call him. You can call him. <laughs> you guys can talk it out. You understand, you know, you understand how Kurt Signetti thinks, but you could also yeah. advise him on what might be best for him in the program, even if it hurts a little bit. Yeah. Donovan Leary at Illinois is somebody we haven't talked about yet, but was another driving force of this entire show because I thought he looked good in the Illinois spring game. He's a third year quarterback this year. He's Devin Leary's brother, the former college quarterback at NC state and Kentucky. Luke Altmeyer does have multiple years of eligibility left. Luke Altmeyer is not on our list of final year as a starter. I just think it's possible that Devin Leary takes this job either sometime in the midst of this season or a situation where Luke Altmeyer can come back next year, but they're kind of like, Hey, it's Donovan Donovan Leary time. Because I I just, I thought it feels like Donovan Leary has a little something. And again, they had, they put John Paddock in when, Mm -hmm. um, uh, when Luke Altmeyer got hurt last year. Yeah. Man, there's a lot of quarterback names here. When Luke Altmaier got hurt last year, they put in John Paddock as a backup quarterback, and John Paddock was like a little mini sensation for a moment. So I think they've they've seen what might happen. I'm not saying John Paddock should have been the starter last year, but I I think this Illinois quarterback situation could be in a little bit of flux. I agree with you. I th- I think Luke Altmaier is probably better than you think. Um, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying like generally than people think and. Maybe everything around him does not put him in the best situation to kind of like let all that shine through. I'm not saying he's awesome, but like he's got some tools that I that I think um, are pretty enticing. Which why he was a fairly highly rated quarterback coming out of high school. Um, the thing I wonder about Luke Altmaier as it pertains to Donovan Leary is like if Illinois is going to have like another bad season, which I kind of think we believe Illinois is going to have another bad season. And even if it's not Luke Altmaier's fault that they have a bad season, there could just come a point where they say, "Like, we're going to shake things up and throw Donovan Leary in there, and see what happens." Yeah. I definitely think that is on the table. Uh, Utah, as we said, in Cam Rising's seventh year, but they have some interesting future lined up because we liked how Isaac Wilson, Zach Wilson's younger brother, looked in the Utah spring game, and then they mm-hmm. added a guy, Landis, that really adds some intrigue here. Yeah, Sam Heward, who is a, I think he was a five-star quarterback, right, in 2021, um, signed with Washington, like didn't play, transferred to Cal Poly, where he played last year, and now he's coming back to the FBS to be uh, Cam Rising's backup this year, like veteran insurance, I guess, in the room as well. Um, should anything happen to Cam Rising, but he also has two years of eligibility left, so he could very well be like a backup this year and the starter next year. It, at the very least, it gives you an opportunity to have some pretty good competition, I think, going into the 2025 season and not just like merely handing it off to a second year player like Isaac Wilson. So I, I don't. Clearly, Sam Heward is not the quarterback people thought he was coming out of high school, but that doesn't mean that he's a bad quarterback necessarily. So I like what Utah has done here to like get a little more experience, but then also give them also some insurance this year and next year. Make it plans. Class of 2021, the top-ranked quarterbacks, number one, Quinn Ewers, number two, Caleb Williams, number four, Drake May, number six, J.J. McCarthy. So that's three guys who just went in the first round of the NFL draft and Quinn Ewers back at Texas in year four. Number three was Sam Heward. Mm-hmm. So he was that's who, that's the company he was keeping coming out of high school. And Utah taking a flyer here is a really good move. Could we still and if that doesn't work, it feels like Isaac Wilson is is on a development path to be ready to go. Yeah. Uh West Virginia, Nico Marchiol. This is just we we love what Garrett Green is and could be. And marquiel has been there a couple years and just seems like next man up and maybe not as high of a ceiling, but it's nice having a, a pretty good backup. And it seems like I don't think he's going to go anywhere. 
No, it was a, the West Virginia people like made a pretty big deal out of the fact that like their collective was able to like lock down both Garrett Green and Nico Markiel. And there was a time prior to last year where I think a lot of people thought that Nico Markiel would have been West Virginia's starting quarterback last year. Um, just like a lot of excitement about a, a, a good quarterback recruit that West Virginia landed. And that hasn't quite panned out that way, but I, I, I don't think that means that the story's over for Nico at West Virginia either. So I, again, possibly another program that could look to bring in a transfer next year after Garrett Green leaves. But I, I think that there's pretty obviously a plan, a succession plan here to have Nico take it over for Garrett Green next year. Next one up is BYU. This is McKay Hillstead. We talked about this on the, uh, last show on Tuesday. They just brought him in. He started a couple games at Utah State last year. Jake Retzlaff and Gary Bohannon are leading the quarterback competition there right now. Retzlaff has multiple years of eligibility. Gary Bohannon, who's, this is his third school, this is his last year. But McKay Hillstead, again, as a guy who was, as a young guy, was starting at Utah State last year, feels like the future. Some people think he even could be in the mix this year, but uh, it felt like a good move for BYU to try to line things up down the line. Yeah, but I, 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 did you say in the last show when we talked about him? And I know some BYU people have said like this guy's going to be the starting quarterback at some, at some point yeah. this year, right? So yeah, we talked about I, that. Like, I don't think some we juice. Need, Yeah, there's something there's something there that people like, and I think it might even like date back to some of the stuff he did in high school, um, just like playing well in big games and like showing a showing a knack for for doing that. So it's wide open at BYU as far as I'm concerned. Like, I don't think Jake Reslav did anything last year that should have him locked into the job. And Gary Bohannon like was good a couple of years ago, but I don't know if that's salvageable for him. Um, so I'm not going to be surprised if McKay Hillstead actually ends up being the starter this year, which if that's the case, then clearly he'll be the starter next year. And the last guy we wanted to include here is Mabry Medauer at Wisconsin. Wisconsin's been on the, Transfer quarterback carousel since Luke Fickle got there. They had Tanner Mordecai last year. They have Tyler Van Dyke this year. They brought in Nick Evers as a transfer, who then has transferred out because he was running with third string. But this is a true freshman from Texas that feels like a, again, this is one of those. This is great. This is great for the North. Go down into the second and third tier of Texas high school quarterbacks. And bring guys up here. You know who was like a second and third tier Texas high school quarterback? Drew Brees. Like, this is great. And I like this plan. And there is a plan. And get off the carousel. And maybe this will be something. I, I don't think this is a guarantee for next year. But I'm glad. This was a pretty big get for Phil Longo. And I think they sold the, the vision of the ultimately what that Wisconsin passing offense can be. And it got a Texas kid to buy into it. It. it it could be something in 2025. Yeah, it could be. He's also a dead ringer for Trevor Lawrence, which is never a bad thing. So, have you have you have you seen the photo of the two of them side by side? They were they were side by side. They got in the same room together. No, no, but you oh, have to you have oh. to you have to do it yourself. But like they go ahead and Google Mabry Matower and see what the see what the young man looks like. He he can convince you very easily that he's actually Trevor Lawrence. And then they also then the third photo was the actress from Ozark. That was the third photo. <laughs> the daughter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that one's like, are you are you kidding me? Yeah. I was like, I cannot believe Trevor Lawrence is an Ozark. So um okay, good. But like that's but good. This is what Wisconsin should be, at least be trying to do. So I'm glad mm -hmm. go get a Texas kid and bring him to Madison, man. I love it. So yeah. listen, that's a lot. I I don't know that we could do this every year. Every team has backup quarterbacks, and you could be like, oh, I guess the backup now could be the starter next year. But I think there are real guys in wait in the North. So we wanted to lay that foundation. All these guys are eligible for our draft. We're going to draft 16 players. But I like the pool, man. There's like there's a Pretty lot of pool. guys. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's a, it's it's, it's going to be a hard. It's going to be a difficult draft. I think it's going to be uh, maybe a little heated, a little competitive. Looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. Oh, no, we'll yell at each other for sure. Uh, I will say, so like in the end, um, there are a couple teams with questions for 2025 that don't have this settled to the degree that it feels like a lot of them are. By my count, I have six expected returning starting quarterbacks for 2025, 10 teams that are going to lose guys but really have somebody lined up, another five teams that 
Maybe their guy will return, or maybe they have somebody lined up like Illinois would qualify here. Either Luke Altmaier in 2025 or Donovan Leary in 2025. And then I only have five teams that at the moment, it feels like we have no idea what their quarterback plan for 2025 would be. Boston College, just because we don't know what's going to happen with Thomas Castellanos, but if he remains the starter this year and wins the job, then that settles that. But are you okay with Boston College in this group for the moment? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Northwestern, which just added Mike Wright, but is only a one-year thing, and we have no idea what Northwestern's quarterback future is probably behind that. They have a Jake Lausch, I think, is in the battle as a younger guy, but I don't know that he's locked in. Questions there for sure. Is that fair? Fair. Syracuse, Kyle McCord has a one-year answer. I don't know that they have any. I think they're out beating the bushes right now for quarterbacks because I don't know that – I don't think they have another quarterback on the roster that was has been brought in by Fran Brown. So I think their future is very much up in the air. They got uh, Jakari Williams in this class. Okay. Three-star player. Three-star player from Georgia was the 42nd overall quarterback in 2024. So, like, I, maybe down the road, like, that's not a profile that screams like 2025 starter, obviously. Iowa up in the air. They added Brendan Sullivan, the Northwestern transfer, as Cade McNamara insurance for this year. I think he also has eligibility remaining, but I, I just – it feels like that's not settled. You're telling them to keep an eye on the kid from Des Moines. It, it, unsettled, I think, at Iowa quarterback is, is fair to say for 2025, mm -hmm. yes? Yep. And then Colorado, I don't even know if Dion's thinking about do they need to have a backup quarterback because I think maybe the whole Sanders family is out after this year, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I That would be my guess at the moment, too. I know Dion said he doesn't follow his kids, but we'll see. <laughs> There's enough parents that yeah. moved to where their kid got drafted, that if Shador is going to be the quarterback of the Giants and Dion's like, I'm moving to New York City. He might yeah. volunteer to still be the Colorado coach while he's in New York City. While he's he in can New fly York, in on yeah. game day. <laughs> fly out after the game to make it back for Shador's game on Sunday. Um, we'll, we'll talk again. We, we have our one-star review about my Colorado views. But again, like I just... I don't know that there's any. I think De Dion's all about now. So like it could be yeah. if he if Dion is at Colorado in 2025, they'll probably have 75 new players. So who knows who the quarterback? Yeah, is no be. idea, no idea. Maybe it'll be Devin Brown. Uh, okay, let's take a break, and when we come back, let's do this draft. 16 Northern quarterbacks based on the totality of their remaining careers. I think it'll tell you something about what we think of the future of Northern quarterbacking. We'll do that next on Kings of the North. Time now for a Northern quarterback draft. Our producer, Mike, is going to have a ticker at the bottom here on YouTube showing the picks as we go. We're going to draft 16 quarterbacks, eight each, based on what we believe the future accumulation of their career will be. Winning, stats, awards, everything. And like if a guy transfers and goes and does it somewhere else, it's like we're, we're taking the quarterback, right? So you could say like, well, I think this guy's going to be really good. Maybe there's not an opportunity here, but it's going to be this great balance of two, three, four years you'd be getting of young guys versus we can draft, Bill, current guys in their final seasons, but you're only yeah. getting one season of them. So you're thinking to yourself, would I rather have one season of Will Howard or would I rather have three or four seasons potentially because some of these guys we're going to draft are going to wind up never being a starter. Maybe the potential yeah. future multiple seasons. So that's that balance. And I think it will tell you about sort of tiers of young quarterbacks in the North, which is kind of what we're trying to get at here. Yeah. And I, I guess I would just add to that just most, maybe to make sure like you and I are on the same page too. It's like one year of Will Howard at Ohio state with everything that that affords a quarterback, like the, the out, like, one year, yeah. one year of Will Howard at Kansas State, I think, is a vastly different conversation than one year of Will Howard at, at Ohio State. If you're drafted Will Howard, and in the end he's lifting a national championship trophy, he throws 42 touchdown passes, even if they're a bunch of short throws, and Jeremiah Smith runs over six people on the way to the end zone, and he's a Heisman finalist, it doesn't matter if he's only a sixth-round pick because yeah. the dude is a national champ, and he's third in the nation in touchdown passes. Mm -hmm. So like, that would be really good. Yeah. Even right. if you think to yourself, well, maybe I would rather as an NFL GM, like being take another eight guys, being a great college quarterback is what this is about. It has right. great value here. So, okay. I think people understand it. And you have the first pick. 
in the Kings of the North Northern quarterback draft. Who are you taking? I'm taking uh, one of Will Howard's backups. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Julian Sayan with the first pick. Um, he is probably, of all the quarterbacks we will draft, I think, the most talented. Okay. Um, when will when we'll get to see that is a fair question. I think at the latest, it's 2025. I do think that there is a non-zero chance that we see it in 2024. Um, and even if you don't, you're still getting two years of high, high level quarterback play with Julian say in, in Ohio state's office. Cause I, like we said, we talked about Julian saying Aaron Nolan, then like, I, I think Aaron Nolan's a good quarterback. I just think Julian saying better. So like, I think Julian saying will win that competition when the time comes, if he hasn't won it already, to be honest. Um, and will be Ohio state starting quarterback in 2025 and 2026, before we're going off to the NFL and over the course of that time, like who knows, man, right? National championship, Heisman trophy, all American stuff. Like it's all on the table. We've seen that happen at, at Ohio state. They've not gotten the the Heisman trophy itself, but they've you know, reasonably good chance that you're going to be a Heisman trophy finalist. If you're a good quarterback in Ohio state's offense. So um, it's just the, there's a lot going on for a kid with this much talent in that offense. So I, I, I thought this was like the obvious first choice. I would have taken him first as well. And it's one of those things you can say, well, there's no guarantees just because you're the number one rated quarterback recruit. Of course. But Trevor Lawrence was the number one quarterback. Mm -hmm. And Bryce Young was the number one quarterback. And before Quinn Ewers reclassified, Caleb Williams was the number one quarterback. So there's no guarantees. But there also is kind of a straight line from you're the number one quarterback in your class to you are incredibly successful in terms of winning and the playoff and the Heisman and stats and Julian Sand is currently on that path. Yeah. And I don't, this is anecdotal and not something I've done research on, but I would bet that over the last five years, maybe, maybe eight years, uh, the hit rate on the highest rate of quarterbacks has been much higher than it was in the previous, in the eight years before that. Like, I just think like kid, kids in high school are like much better, and offenses are much more quarterback friendly. The game, I think, is much more quarterback friendly where like, yes, it's fair to point out that not everyone hits, but I think you have a better chance of it happening than, than not. So Julian saying, I think was an obvious number one here. I'll be curious to see if you think this is an obvious number two, because I'm going to take Dylan Rayola from Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you will get three years of starting from him, uh, assuming there's no injury and assuming it doesn't blow up maybe four and that by year three, let's make a prediction right now. Do you think Dylan Rayola will lead Nebraska to a playoff appearance in his career? I do. I do too. I don't think it's guaranteed, but the idea that in year three, in 2026, could Dylan Rayola help Nebraska be the fourth best team in the Big Ten? That seems quite possible. Yeah. To me. And it's been such a winding road with the recruitment. It started off with Patrick Mahomes comparisons because he tippy toes the same way. <laughs> and then I think it got away. I think there was a backlash to that. And now he's not at Ohio State or Georgia. He's at Nebraska. And it's like, well, what happened there? I think he's a really good quarterback. So I think, would you have taken him too here as well? He was number two on my on my big board that I have here in my notebook in front of me that I'm not going to show you. Oh, you just show. Oh, I can't see it. You just showed the YouTube <laughs> audience. And my no, I showed on, is I showed on the back. I showed, on, oh. I showed on the back of the book. Yeah, the back You could the literally book. have 75 names written on there. Just and I put it on the wall behind me and like you wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So I have, I, I'll, I'll be curious. I'm going to wing it at the end. My big board is 11 guys long. So I'll be curious. We're each drafting eight. If I, if that's enough or if I'm going to have to wing it at the end. All right. Pick yeah. three to you. I feel like I got to put my money where my mouth is here and take Aiden Childs. Okay. I respect the consistency. How many years do you think Aiden Childs will be the starting quarterback at Michigan State? That is the, I I kind of I mean at least two right this year next year, um. I can convince myself 
that it can be three, right? It's, I don't know just yet, like how he is viewed as a potential NFL prospect, right? So if that's the case, if that's a little bit up in the air, it's like, well, maybe he actually plays out all of his eligibility and you get three years out of him. And if I'm getting three years out of him, like that last year, I think is going to be a banger. But even if it's not, like, I think, I think by 2025, like going into the 2025 season, there will be conversations about Aiden Childs as like one of the best returning quarterbacks in college football. Like, so I'm okay with that, even if I don't get the third year. Um, and I, I like I like that I, he's gonna he's gonna go through some stuff this year, and I and I guess it's a fair question of like whether or not Jonathan Smith can get the roster to where it needs to be heading into the 2025 season to like bring out the best of whatever Aiden Childs is at that moment. Um, so like that's probably a worth taking into consideration when making this pick too. But I kind of believe in Jonathan Smith to get the roster right by then. I like that Aiden Childs like already knows this offense because he's coming with Jonathan Smith and Oregon State, and I think the talent is there to be one of the better quarterbacks in the sport by this, his second year starting uh, for the Spartans. So um, all of that it makes me comfortable taking him over like maybe one of the one-year guys you know, we start yeah. considering at this point. Yeah, I had him fifth on my big board. I think it's a good pick. I'm, I'm glad you took him. I think it all makes sense, and maybe the only thing that would hold you back a little bit is some of the roster stuff that you talked yeah. about. That if if the Jonathan Smith era at Michigan State takes a little while to get going, then maybe he'll never fully realize the benefits of it, but he also might be the engine that drives the Jonathan sure. Smith era and leads them to something. And by his third year as a starter, they're a playoff contender, and they're winning 10 games, and he's getting to New York. So mm. I, I like that pick. I like this pick better, though. This was the guy who I had third on my board, and I'm going to take C.J. Carr from Notre Dame. Yeah. I think he could win a Heisman, which is not a crazy thing to say about a Notre Dame player, but this new he might, he might be exactly the guy that Marcus Freeman is looking for, that there was enthusiasm around the Marcus Freeman hire. They've been in this portal thing for a couple of years to try to get it going. It's pretty good. I think Notre Dame is ascending. They've got to get the receiver situation figured out, but they fired the receivers coach. They brought in a new receivers coach. I can see that getting better. They always have good tight ends. If they, It feels like the infrastructure around the starting quarterback will continue to improve. It's going to be a good defense. They need to make sure that the offensive coordinator and all this stuff works, right? There's you lose Tommy Rees, and that was a lot like there's a there is a lot going on there. But I think a CJ Carr can help settle it. And also I think it will just Marcus Freeman will continue to grow the stability and the substance of that program and get me CJ Carr in 2026 and let's see where Notre Dame is. So I just yeah. was borderline. I don't want to say blown away. I was very impressed with how he looked as a true freshman in the spring game. And am I overdrafting him here as a result? Or did you have him pretty high? Uh, I had him lower. I probably would not have taken him for a couple more picks, but, but I don't, I don't think you're off base. Like the thing I, I wonder about what exactly will be put around him. Because um, mm -hmm. Notre Dame has just like really struggled, I think, to like find the right kind of combination of skill players, and that's like a that predates Sparkus Freeman, and it seems like there's reason to be excited about where it's headed, but I can't like fully wrap my arms around that just yet. But the other part of it that does excite me is like I don't think Mike Dembrock's going to go anywhere, right? He's 60 mm -hmm. years old. Like I don't think he's going to be a good OC and then try to go be a head coach somewhere. Like and if he's already left LSU to go back to Notre Dame, then I think there's some longevity there that CJ Carr can like really grow in a system that was good at Cincinnati when they had Desmond Ritter and obviously produced a Heisman trophy winner last year at LSU uh, with uh, Jaden Daniels. So um, I like it. I think, I think it's, I, I guess I don't, I'm not like a hundred percent there on like CJ Carr has like a Heisman trophy ceiling, but I think it's pretty close and maybe the offensive system can help get them over the top and get them there. So I don't think it's a bad pick. So I'm now officially at a point where, I'm very nervous that you're going to take the guy that I really want with my next pick. So go ahead with pick number five. Mm, I'm a little torn, actually, because there's a guy that I there's a guy that like when I like made my board is like I want to get this guy, but I also think I'm 
All right, I'm going to do it. I'm taking Rocco back. No! <laughs> now I should have taken him ahead of CJ. <laughs> yeah, Rocco back to Iowa State because like, he was good last year as a retro freshman. I think he will be better this year. And I also think that he will absolutely use all of his eligibility. Like, I think we're getting three more years of Rocco back at Iowa State. I am I am 100% confident in that. So, like, by the time this is over, I think Rocco Beck's going to be, like, one of the top five quarterbacks in college football, right? So, what we um, did that? he should have gone third then. Then this is too low. Like, if the, I'm so mad. Oh, I really wanted CJ Carr, though. I get it. So you're get because we've seen it. That's the one difference, right? Like even with Aiden Childs, we haven't seen it. He he played a little bit. Like we Rocco Beck yeah. was good. Yeah, but Aiden Childs like like traits I think like has a much higher ceiling than Rocco Beck. Okay. Then can I have him? Can you change your pick? No. Nope. Iowa State's in a great spot, and they have a starting quarterback who. Is leading a Super Bowl contender every year. Like this is not like what? What if Rocco Beck is Brock Purdy plus? Plus, yeah, yeah, right. Like that. It's like, oh, I mean, what's Iowa State ever produced? It's like I don't know. Ask Kyle Shanahan what they produce. It's like, oh, he'll, he'll be better than that. Because I felt like Brock Purdy, and again, people, I, I've said this. I picked Iowa State as like my dark horse playoff team a couple of years ago, and the, the last year for Brees Hall and Brock Purdy. And they're like, they won, they went seven and six or whatever. But like the year before, they were building to something. And so, like, now, good coach. We love their receivers this year. We like the infrastructure at Iowa State that they lose assistance because they get poached by bigger teams and programs and they still find a way to win. Matt Campbell, I think, is part of this pick, is it not? That as long as Matt Campbell stays at Iowa State, you could have a belief that. They're going to maximize what they can be. And I think the proof of having two receivers like they have this year shows that they should continue to put weapons around Rocco Becht. Yeah, yes. But I, I also think that's maybe a fair question to raise, too. It's like, because they're not going to have, um, was it Jalen Nolan, Jaden Higgins after, after this year? Right? I, I think right. may, maybe maybe Jaden Higgins, but I don't think they're going to have Jalen Nolan after this year. Um, so, But then, they like, just had they, Xavier Hutchinson, who I loved for a couple for sure. years. Like, yeah, no, I, I come play they, at Iowa State and catch balls, man. They know how to build a roster, I think. Like within within their limitations of what the like is going on in names, like they know how to build a roster. So um I'm not I'm not worried about Rocco Beck having weapons moving forward. I think it's just a point worth making that like he has two very good receivers right now, and he might not have them after this year. So I'm drawing the line here. This is a line for me on guys based on their future. I'll be I'll be curious to see how you view this, but this was my clear top five, and these were the five that to me are the fun of the exercise. And now you have to start thinking about mixing in some one year guys. But we agree mm -hmm. this is a tier. Yes, yeah, hundred okay. percent. So we're seeing this the same way. So that I'm going to take Shadur Sanders one year mm -hmm. this year. I think maybe stats through the roof. Four real receivers at Colorado. I know they're, they say they're going to run it more. People talk about this guy as a top five pick in the NFL draft. That We're not drafting based on NFL, but I think he's a better NFL prospect than Dylan Gabriel. I know that Oregon will be a better team, maybe five times better team than Colorado this year. But I think maybe you still could look and say, Shadur Sanders is better than Dylan Gabriel. And so when we, when we were ranking quarterbacks in the North just for this season, which we did a couple months ago, Shadur Sanders and Dylan Gabriel are our top two. But who do I actually think is going to be the more talented, better quarterback this year? I think it's Shadur Sanders. Who will win more games? Maybe throw for more yards. Maybe get more hardware. Maybe Dylan Gabriel. But I, I'm still comfortable taking Sanders here. Yeah, I, I I had him lower because I just, for the exercise, I think I tried to value the hardware, right? I tried to value yeah. What it, I, I Shadur Sanders is going to be like a good stats on a bad team guy, um, which doesn't do a whole lot for me, I think, in this particular exercise. And it's not, it's not to take away from his talent because I think he has a ton of it. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready to take him just yet. I would have waited a few picks, I think. Um, but I, I, again, I don't disagree with anything you said. I think, I think we're, if it was just to pick a guy you think is the best quarterback, then Shadur Sanders would have been gone already. And I do think it's a bit of a weird year nationally for quarterbacks, like who are the best. I mean, people have talked about this in terms of 
guys coming back, like last year at this time, like Caleb Williams mm -hmm. was returning. And Bo Nix and Michael Penix, we didn't necessarily know the leaps they were going to make, but they were returning. And the year before that, CJ Stroud and Bryce Young were both returning. And the year before that, for a couple of years, you know, there was a year when Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence were both returning. And so the quarterbacks that you know about that are returning this year are Quinn Ewers at Texas, Carson Beck at Georgia, Jalen Milrow at Alabama, but it's a bit of a dip. I mean, we've talked about it. There's a lot of sort of bridge quarterbacks in the North. Overall, nationally, I think there's a bit of a dip. Some people love Carson Beck. They can love Carson Beck. That's fine. He's not Bryce Young. He's not CJ Stroud. He's not Caleb Williams. So my point to that is, I think Shadur Sanders could be a second team All American. So in terms of like hardware, I, I there I think there could be a world where people are like, hey, we're voting on stuff. Who's the best quarterback? Yeah, and Shadur Sanders could be in that conversation because I don't know that you would say, well, he's no Quinn Ewers, he's no Carson Beck, he's no Jalen Milrow. I I don't know that you would say that. And maybe Dylan Gabriel and Will Howard and some guys will compile more wins and maybe more stats. I think it's. I think it's possible that people, by the end of the year, I'm not predicting it. I think it's possible that Shadur Sanders could be the best quarterback in college football if that's the conversation. I think so, because I, I think right now I believe that Colorado's roster this year is, is better than it was last year. Um, so like, if Colorado is like back in the bowl game picture and Shadur – statistically stacks up with a lot of other the court a lot of other quarterbacks and teams that are like playing vying for playoff spots he might have that like i'm not saying he's lamar jackson but like that lamar jackson kind of mm -hmm. heisman case where like yes he's not a quarterback of a playoff team where a team is contending for a national championship but like his team was good they won a decent amount of games and like he just put up bonkers numbers and there's nobody else on a playoff team that's like really running away with this thing so like i don't he is definitely a heisman trophy candidate for sure uh, yeah. Whether or not he'll be a finalist in the end, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I feel more confidently about a couple other guys like definitely being in that conversation than I do Shadur Sanders. And if they're three and nine again, then he's not going to be. But sure. they can be moderately more competitive. All right, so yeah. that was pick number six. Pick seven to you. I will take Dylan Gabriel with okay. this pick. Um, like super productive. Again, again, it's not it's not an NFL conversation in my mind because if it was, I wouldn't pick him. But super productive college quarterback. The most experienced quarterback in college football. Oregon is going to be in a national title picture all year. We saw what that did for Bo Nix last year. Got him to New York. Like I think Dylan Gabriel probably goes to New York. I think he's got a very good chance of winning the Heisman Trophy, like being an All-American, winning a ton of games, and potentially winning a national championship. So even if it's only for one year, I'll take all that. So those are our top two veteran guys. You're only getting a year out of them, but we feel like the guaranteed success to some degree of this one year is better than the possibility of some younger guys. But now I'm going to go back young again. And I do, I do feel like there's a somewhat significant drop off. So this is rolling the dice a little bit, but I'll take mm -hmm. DeMond Williams Jr. From Washington right here. Yep. That's not a reach. Nope. I had him. I had one more name on my big board that wasn't already crossed out ahead of him so just feels like there's there's a real potential there it feels like there's mm -hmm. a confidence there's an intelligence there's a belief that matters he's not super tall but if he wasn't really accurate in the spring game but he's a young guy it feels like there's an arm there there's a pocket movement there and then there's clearly running ability there so this sure. this could be a really interesting package and for all the things that washington fans may have to take some lumps with this year it's nice to have a quarterback in your back pocket that you think has a chance to be a dude starting in 2025. Yeah. And I think he's got um, a way of playing that has a chance to like captivate mm -hmm. college football fans. Like once, once it's his turn um, doesn't mean, I, I also think there could be like a little bit of like cam ward in there when it's like, okay, you don't have to try to make a play on every single snap. Um, but there's also like a lot of electric football ability in there too right so i think yeah. it, i think it's a good pick yeah okay so that was pick number eight number nine to you um i guess i'll stick to my board and how i have guys stacked up i'm gonna take riley leonard oh okay that's interesting i said my board only went to 11 i didn't have him on there is there a gap 
or how big, I mean, there is a gap because we took Sanders and Gabriel first. How big of a gap do you think there is between Sanders and Gabriel as one year Northern quarterbacks and Leonard? Is it a big gap or a tiny gap? It's a, I think it's a decent size gap. Yeah. Um, Cause Riley Leonard's still a whole lot of projection, right? He like, for a guy who's going into his final year of college football, he hasn't thrown the ball a whole lot. What would he, yeah. what'd we say he had four touchdown passes last year or three touchdown passes last year. There is a, like a lot of work that needs to be done with him as a passer. So like, I'm clearly banking on that by, by picking him here. Um, it's again, it's an, it's another piece of the Dembrock conversation. It's like, I, I saw what you did at LSU and you're taking a guy with a, a lot of um, raw skills to work with now and Riley Leonard, who, has the potential to be among the best running quarterbacks in the country uh, this year. So like, I think you get a ton of production that way. And like, if you're, if you're doing that, if you're one of the more productive running quarterbacks in the country, if you take a step forward as a passer and you're the starting quarterback at Notre Dame, which I think is going to have a really good season. I, I had them fifth in my playoff picks and we did them um, back in January and, and floated the idea that they might go undefeated this year. Like all that to me adds up to a guy that could really position himself to, to, come away with again some hardware this season not a national championship i don't i don't think that's where notre dame is necessarily um but like heisman trophy consideration all american consideration just like really taking a huge jump um in the right kind of environment i think is on the table for for riley leonard and i just think like the ceiling there is higher the the floor is probably lower but the ceiling there is also higher than a couple of other potential one-year guys you could take at this point Okay. I'm going to take Drew Aller. And who do you think will have the better year this year, Riley Leonard or Drew Aller? You think Riley Leonard will have a significantly better year? I think Riley Leonard will have a significantly better year. Yeah. Because you're potentially getting two years of Aller. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about, like, he he is maybe, he might be the only in-between guy in this whole, whole exercise where he's returning as a guaranteed experienced starter, but he also has eligibility remaining. There are just not a lot of guys like this. We're talking a lot about last year guys, and we're talking a lot about future guys. He's both. And so I think it's easy for him to fall through the cracks. I did have him ninth on my big board. I'll take him 10 here. Was he held back by the offense and the coordinator in his first year as a starter at Penn State and the lack of receivers? And it's not that the receivers have been totally fixed, but you add Julian Fleming, even though you lost Keandre Lambert Smith, you bring a new coordinator. Maybe James Franklin realized that again, you've talked a lot about like no matter who the coordinator is, is James Franklin putting reins on them. Maybe James Franklin expands his mind a little bit. And does that mean a new and improved Drew Aller or whatever limitations we saw from Drew Aller previously? Is that just more about Drew Aller, which is not a bad quarterback, but is a quarterback that would have, there's a cap on what he could be. Yeah, I guess I'm playing the, I think there's more there and the changes will help us see that. And you might be anticipating, uh, I think what he is and isn't is more of a reflection on the player. I, I think it's more a reflection of the player, but I, I think I probably still would have picked him here because you still you do get those two years, you get the extra yeah. year, you get the second year in the Andy Coltonicki offensive system. Um I think he'll be better. Uh I just don't I, I, I don't know what ultimately he becomes, right? I don't I don't know that I, I I there's some limitations there that I don't know if he'll be able to overcome. Um Especially when it comes to like throwing the ball down the field and like seeing things the right way and like throwing with anticipate like that, it just hasn't translated yet. And I think it's not the end of the world that it hasn't. But at this point, I am questioning a little bit if it will or like to what extent that it will. And mm-hmm. then the other piece of it too is like I think Penn State's offense will be better, but I also think like Bo Perbula might have a role to play in that too, right? Yeah. Like, not that it's going to be like a pure two quarterback system, but I don't know ultimately like what percentage of the success will be attributed to Drew Aller. Like I think some of it could be taken by, by Bo, Bo Pribula. And we didn't really talk about Bo Pribula. He's in between Aller and Grunkmeyer. He mm-hmm. could be Penn State starting quarterback in 2025 because Drew True. Aller leaves or because he somehow beats out. He's a really interesting because the last time Penn State had a guy like this, it was Will Levis and he left and became a starter at Kentucky and uh, second round draft pick the NFL. So we're thinking about what Bo Prabula could be 
That could be mm-hmm. at Penn State or it could be somewhere else. He is a very interesting Northern quarterback that really didn't fit in any of the boxes we were talking about, but he's worth remembering. For sure. Yeah, I think so. All right. That was um, pick 10, Drew Aller. Pick 11 to you. I'm going to go with another one-year guy and pick Garrett Green at West Virginia. Oh, okay. Now you're just getting all the – okay. I see how it's going now. Yeah. Uh, this is a good pick. I might take Garrett Green over Riley Leonard. Yeah, I could – maybe. I can I can, I can can see that. But I got them both, so who cares, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I think I think that's probably fair. I got I, – I do – I do think if everything comes together for Riley Leonard, he will have a better season than Garrett Green. Um, but I think Garrett Green's about to have a great season. I think West Virginia, we both think West Virginia's going to have a really good season. Um, so Garrett Green, I think, has an opportunity to be like a top 10 quarterback in college football this year. Like, Does that, does that sound unreasonable to oh, you? No. I think he's I got, said on the show, though, I thought maybe Garrett Green could be a first-round pick, and you were like, hey, he's a little short. I don't think he's a first-round pick. Um and I don't even know, frankly, if he's an NFL quarterback because of some physical limitations. But um, he's like a he's a big play quarterback, right? He's an exciting quarterback. He's an excellent runner. Will will make aggressive throws, um, maybe sometimes to his detriment. But like at, at the end of the day, he's a fun quarterback to watch. So um, like outside chance, I think maybe of of squeaking his way into the Heisman conversation if West Virginia actually does have the kind of season we're talking about. Um, and he'll be part of like a three-headed monster rushing attack there that I think will be really fun to watch. So I just think there's a lot of production on tap for for Garrett Green this year. And even if it doesn't come with any kind of hardware, um, I think when we look up at the end of the year, he'll, he'll stack up statistically as one of the better quarterbacks in the sport. Let me ask you a question that will turn the stomachs of both West Virginia fans and Pitt fans. Can Garrett Green have a Kenny Pickett year? Yeah, I think so. I don't know what would hold him back from that. And the result is now, because that's the thing. If you have a Kenny Pickett year now, you're in the playoff. Right? Mm-hmm. Like that's what that, that was. It was a New Year's Six get bowl game year back then, 11 win season, right? Now you're a playoff team, which I predicted in our first uh, playoff picks that West Virginia would be. That's what we're talking about. So it's such a defining game. Penn State, West Virginia, right from the jump in the opener. It's going to tell us so much about what Garrett Green might be this year, what Drew Aller might be this year, the paths of both those teams. It doesn't mean the loser is going to have a bad year, but man, I, we're going to find out. We're not going to have to wait around to wonder, I think, about either of those programs. We're going to know what, yeah. what we're getting in Penn State and West Virginia in week one. All right, Garrett Green at 11 is an excellent pick. I'm going to go back to the young guy, and this is I'm going to take him at 12. I had him 10th on my list. And it's Jaden Davis at Michigan, and it's the idea of what if what if Michigan, even without Jim Harbaugh, knows how to develop quarterbacks now. This is a top 10 national recruit at quarterback. He seems lined up to potentially take the job in 25, if not in, then in 26. You get a couple years out of him, and Michigan at the moment is one of the five best programs in college football, and he might be the next guy up. And if, if you look at it from that lens, if you look at all the possibility – you know, they have a bunch of new skill guys there, but they're always going to recruit pretty well. Mm-hmm. They're always going to have a good offensive line. If you don't think Michigan's going to fall off a cliff and you just see him as the future of Michigan quarterback play, I think Michigan fans maybe would make an argument that we should have taken Jaden Davis way before this because really is the gap that wide between Julian Sayan and Jaden Davis that one is the number one pick overall here and one is the 12th pick. I mean, there's a gap. I think there's a reasonable gap, but maybe it's not as big as this draft would make it seem. I think there's a pretty big gap. Um, but also, too, like that does, we just saw a top 10 quarterback like come and go at Michigan. Like he won a national title, like uh, clearly he won a national title, but like nowhere along the course of JJ McCarthy's career that people say, like, yeah, that guy's the best quarterback in college football. Even though he clearly had a bunch, of, like a ton of talent. Yeah. So you're you're saying the style? If you assume that Michigan's still going to be a run first program, the style of the offense might hold back even a very talented quarterback. Yeah, for the purposes not of hold back from winning, anyway. but hold back from awards and stats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you have Jaden Davis on your big board at all? 
I did. Yeah. I had him uh, 15th. Okay. Yeah. In range. All mm-hmm. right. So I took him 12th, 13th pick to you. Uh, I will take Will Howard here. Okay. Because he might win the national title. <laughs> and it, I, I think it's a different conversation than Dylan Gabriel, who also might win the national title, because I don't think that Will Howard is going to be the engine of Ohio State's success. I think Will Howard is more like, we're going to put you out there, like navigate us, play a little point guard, run the ball when we ask you to, mostly don't screw this up um, kind of thing, which is like a different ask of Ohio State quarterbacks than what we've seen in the past. I think it's a different ask from what will be asked of Julian Sane once he takes over as Ohio State's quarterback. But regardless, when you are the starting quarterback at Ohio State and the national championship is always in sights, the Heisman Trophy, I think, could still be in sights for Will Howard. Like, he is among the favorites going into the year, I think. I, I, I don't know that I buy necessarily that he will have the statistical production to get there unless he, like, ends up throwing, like, I don't know. I guess he could throw like 35 touchdowns and rush for 12, right? And then like, and then I think he probably is in that conversation if Ohio State is a top five team and he does all of that. Like, I, I guess I'm trying to make a distinction between like what we've seen as the best version of Ohio State quarterback play and what I think Will Howard will be this year because I think they will be very different. But I still still think Will Howard stands to be very productive, obviously, and winning quarterback for Ohio State, even if it's only going to be one season that I'm getting with this pick. Is Craig Krenzel the comparison here? I, I think like that's the floor. Like in terms of like production, like I, I like I don't just like a, a defense first team, great run game, national champion. That if you said Craig Krenzel was the blank best player on Ohio State's 2002 team, mm. uh, I don't know. You would say he's the what? I don't know. Eleventh. 14th, I don't know, in a world where you have Michael Jenkins and Maurice Claret yeah. and Will Smith and Chris Gamble and, you know, you've got dudes, but he made winning plays when needed. He could move, right? right? Run, move a little bit. Yeah. And what's the result? Good enough? More than good enough. More than good enough, right? yeah. He's an NFL quarterback. Craig Krenzel was an NFL quarterback. He wasn't a first-round draft pick, but I actually think, like, for you to say, like, the floor, I actually think that's pretty good. Craig Crunch yeah. is a pretty good college quarterback. He just wasn't the star or the engine of a national championship team, but it was a very capable driver. Yeah, I said I said floor because I was like more thinking of statistical production, but like it was a different era of college football and a vastly different Ohio State offense. So like Will Howard will like throw for more yards and more touchdowns than Craig Crunch yeah. did this year, right? That's that's kind of what I meant. But but I think like the idea is not a bad comparison. Yeah. Okay. Is it the weirdest storyline in college football that Ohio State is chasing a national championship with Kansas State's quarterback that they were kind of okay losing, who's probably going to win the job, but not for sure, at a place where Ryan Day has been defined by quarterback play, and now they're defined by a million other things, but yet they might be the best team in the country? It's a little strange, yeah. Because I, I was, I, I actually want, so there was what? There was like 150 picks like between quarterbacks in the draft, right? Mm-hmm. Between, um, between I guess it would have been Bo Nix, right? And, and Spencer, Spencer Rattler. Rattler. Yeah. And I saw some Ohio State fans like maybe throw out there like, oh, well, Howard, maybe he should have gone to the draft. Maybe he would have landed in between. And I thought the like my view on that was like I don't think Will Howard would have gotten drafted. <laughs> right. He had he come out last year based on how this draft played out. And I'm not a I think he will get drafted coming out of Ohio State, but I don't like he and he we had him on an Ohio State show and he said he was getting feedback like third, fifth round. Like I don't I don't think he's that kind of player. Um, but I think he could be a good college quarterback and a good enough yeah. college quarterback for Ohio State to do what it wants to do. Okay. All right, pick 14, I'll take Eli Holstein because I keep talking about him. And if he becomes maybe the starter at some point this season for Pitt, although I don't want to assume anything about Nate Yarnell, um, I think he will be the starter in 2025, and then you're off to the races. So did you have him on your big board? I did not have him on my big board. Is this a reasonable but, pick, or you think it's a reach? Yeah, I think so. I think we're we're kind of getting to the bottom here. Um I there's one guy I like definitely would have picked over him, I think. Okay. Well, you could take yeah. him now with what would be your final pick at number 15. 
This is my final pick. Yep. Hmm. I'm not going to take the guy I say I would definitely pick because I want to. I want to. I want to go with the heart here rather than the head. Okay. Tyler Cherry is my last pick. Oh yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Tyler Cherry at Indiana. Um, just a lot of tools, man. He's a big cat and he's got a big arm. And I think there, I was like reading some people's analysis of the 2024 quarterback class as I was like preparing for this. And there were a couple that said Tyler Cherry, like might've actually had the strongest arm in the quarterback class. Wow. Now a strong arm doesn't guarantee you much of anything. There are plenty of guys who have a strong arm, but can't locate where they're actually throwing the ball. Um, but I think there's, there's a, there's a chance that Tyler Cherry like ends up being a real kind of steal, I think, for Indiana maybe down the road. Um, so I'll bet on the upside and I'll and I'll take that chance and take it off my last pick. Uh, it's a good pick and it'll pair nicely with my final pick, who is Marcos Davila from Purdue, and was one of the reasons we did this exercise. So there's a couple guys, like one year guys, Kyle McCord at Syracuse, Will Rogers at Washington. I think you could that might win games and put up good stats this year. Mm-hmm. But we went future here at the end. Who was the guy that you you said you definitely would get would have taken ahead of uh, Holstein? Dante Moore. Okay. Um I am just um I think that the presence of Austin Novosad just pulls me back a little bit from there. And just a little bit, again, we're very used to transfers, but the whole Dante more like commit to Oregon, decommit, go to UCLA, play, then go back to Oregon. I just am, um, it makes me a little uncertain because he's had, even in a portal world, that's like a little extra uncertainty. So mm-hmm. I think on talent, you could probably say Dante Moore should have been picked in the top 16. But I think based on opportunity and, you know, Cherry and Davila, they're young. They haven't gone anywhere yet. I, I think maybe the uncertainty scared us away from more a little bit. Yeah, I think I think that that's fair. And also, like, when this, and it's I don't I'm not trying to like say a guy's never going to be good because he wasn't good as a true freshman. Dante Moore looked quite bad when UCLA put him put him in there last year. So like, he's got to prove it a little bit too. I think when he gets the opportunity. Yeah, no, I I think that's reasonable, and he he's very. Um, much open to proving us wrong and making us look silly by being awesome at Oregon next year. So I do think this was worthwhile. I think it gave you an indication of what we think about quarterback play in the North. And we'll recap the draft very quickly here. Number one pick was Julian Sand of Ohio State. Number two, Dylan Rayola of Nebraska. Number three, Aiden Childs from Michigan State. Number four, CJ Carr from Notre Dame. Number five, Rocco Beck from Iowa State. It made me scream when Bill did that to me. Number six, Shadur Sanders from Colorado. Number seven, Dylan Gabriel from Oregon. Number eight, Damon Williams Jr. from Washington. Number nine, Riley Leonard from Notre Dame. Number 10, Drew Aller at Penn State. Number 11, Garrett Green at West Virginia. Another great pick by Bill. Number 12, Jaden Davis from Michigan. Number 13, Will Howard from Ohio State. Number 14, Eli Holstein from Pitt. Number 15, Tyler Cherry from Indiana. And number 16, Marcos Davila from Purdue. How do you feel about our draft? I feel really good about it. Yeah. I Again, I feel like <laughs> the second time we've done like a quasi quarterback ranking where I leave feeling like Garrett Green went too low. <laughs> I know. What are we doing? <laughs> like we can't. We love the guy and yet we are still held back. So we'll get him on. That'll be the result. Yeah. We'll get Garrett Green on and we'll apologize for taking him too low in all of our drafts. All right. That was long, but I hope it was informative and interesting. We like doing shows where we dig in. On a couple Northern teams, we also like doing shows like this where we feel like we definitely said all 26 Northern teams' names in here. Even if we said, Iowa, we don't know what we're doing (laughs) with the Hawkeyes there. How do we evaluate that? We want to have times where we find a subject and touch on every team in the North so that you hear your team's name and you hear our analysis of your team. But then you also learn about a lot of other teams. So I hope people come away with this excited about Rocco Becht, excited about Garrett Green, excited about Julian Sayan, excited about Aiden Childs and CJ Carr and all these uh, different quarterbacks in the North because I think uh, good times are ahead. Yep. Thanks, as always, to our producer, Mike Urostowski, who makes us look good and sound good. For now, he's Bill Landis. I'm Doug Maurice, and that was Kings of the North. <laughs>